All right, so let's try to do some work with what we've seen so far in the way of hypothesis tests. Um, we're going to formulate um, tests and we're going to look to see if we can kind of find evidence um, either in support of a so-called null hypothesis or against a null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is a statement about a population parameter that you wish to test. And we're going to see similar um, patterns for how we do these different tests. So it's a statement about a population parameter that you wish to test. H naught, H, and then that zero that you see down here, sub zero. Um, sometimes not in a U G H T. I think it's spelled is used to reference um, H not is generally generally used to reference the null hypothesis. Now, for our tests, there are going to be these patterns that we see, where we determine a test statistic, right? And by test statistic, I mean one of these three values. And then once we get this test statistic, we want to know um, if that is an improbable value. Um, so we're going to do a comparison. Either we'll get the probability of these values occurring, or we'll compare any of these test statistics to um, critical values. Um, and so there are two ways of doing it. So critical values are typically the easier way of doing a hypothesis tests. Um, so in a nutshell, you'll have some sample IQ, sample age, sample height, sample weight. Um, you'll compare that sample IQ to what some accepted value might be. So maybe the accepted IQ is 100. You're going to get a sample of individuals, maybe 49 of them, and you're going to say, all right, what if those individuals have a particular IQ? And you're going to measure that distance from the assumed value, what we're going to call the null hypothesis value. If that distance is too great, um, statistically it's not supposed to happen. So we need to define what that means as to it being too great. And there's a parameter, so-called confidence level alpha, that we're going to use to help us know when to accept or reject. So for all of our tests, we're just getting a sample and seeing how far away it is from some given value. That, by and large, is what our hypothesis test will do for us. Um, so we can do it in terms of means, given, um, given some population mean. We can go get a sample and find out what the average is and see how far away we are. Um, and then which uh, one of these test statistics we use, in this case if we're looking at means, right, if we're looking at means it's going to depend on whether or not we have sigma or whether we don't. So from our, if we don't have sigma, um, then we're going to use a t distribution. Um, this t test, and since we have our sample, we can always get the sample standard deviation. Um, and then once we get those values, we can just make a comparison, and then we can make our decision. Now the one above here at the top, kind of similar in that we're seeing how far away we are from assume, from some assumed proportion and then seeing the probability of that occurring. So all of these follow a pattern. We have assumed values and then we have samples and we want to know how far away is our sample away from some null hypothesis value. Um, the idea of it being null or zero is kind of the initial null fundamental value um, and then the value that we generate sometimes is called the number one or the alternative. Um, the other tests, once we get comfortable with the mechanics of generating a test statistic coming from our sample, um, we're going to move 
to generating a test statistic again, but we may have two samples. For example, if we say that um, there's a belief that the difference in um, between the men and women that wish to vote for a candidate, maybe it's believed that the difference in between men and women and their likelihood to vote for a candidate um, might be 0.05 if we sub to the subtraction. Maybe men have a 55. This is what we know about the population. It's it's told that um, men are 55% uh, want to vote. That's the percentage or the proportion that wish to vote for a candidate versus 50%. That difference is 0.05. If you believe that um, that that difference is something else, you can go maybe go to a class and sample them and you may find that um, the men actually it's maybe 57 percent that wish to vote for a candidate let's make this more realistic here um, and make this point one it has to add up to 100 and so and then this might be 0.43 your numbers could certainly look different um, so uh, the difference between those would be 0.15. So what's the likelihood that that could occur by chance? Um, and so we can use our test, we can use our sample, and then um, because we know what the distribution looks like, we can go forward and establish probabilities. Um, so that's for proportions and that's for two populations. So you'll see on your calculator something like two prop, two proportion versus one proportion, Z test. Um, um, and it's referring to whether or not we're looking at, we're looking at just one sample or two sample proportions or even two sample means. Maybe the difference in test scores between men and women um, might be some assumed value. Well, you can go and get mean scores between men and women, um, um, average scores, and then determine if that difference is significant or not. Um, and which one we use, once again, is going to be uh, determined by whether or not you have the population standard deviation here, sigma, or whether you, right, do you have this? population standard deviation or do you just have the sample standard deviation. So notice that all of these simply follow the same pattern. And these examples that um, that we're looking at take us through, the, if you get comfortable with this pattern, this takes us through chapter 8 and then with two populations it moves us into chapter 9 um, and then it, once we move forward into um, the next chapter, um, chapter 10 or chapter 11, um, chapter 11 also deals with generating a, a, a different test statistic, chi-squared. Um, but we're going to use that test statistic that's generated and then make a comparison um, to some critical value. So for all of these, we're generating test statistics from a sample um, and then looking to see if that goes beyond some critical value. Um, so that's the pattern. The alternative hypothesis versus the null hypothesis. So the, as a kind of a brief few words about a null hypothesis, the null hypothesis we will typically state H for hypothesis, zero to indicate that it's the null hypothesis, colon, so dot dot the null hypothesis might be, and these are just simply examples, that the proportion, um, maybe the proportion of candidates uh, or uh, population, the proportion of individuals that wish to vote for 
um, a candidate or um, an issue, drinking beer on the beach or something. Um, let's say that it's 50%. Or maybe another example would be a null hypothesis that states that the average temperature of an adult human is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so those are um, those are two and maybe a third one might be let's say that we believe that the average height of women in the US of adult women um, between 18 and 40 might be 53.6 inches. So we could test all of these ideas, right? We could test proportions by going and grabbing a sample. We could test temperatures by working with a sample and, and heights of women, for example. So um, those are examples of null hypotheses. Um, for the alternative, an alternative statement would be something like this, where sometimes you'll see an H1. Um, and more commonly you'll see just simply H1. Well, I, and I'm, I'm not going to say that's more common. You can see an H1 or an HA. So let's, let's use the HA alternative hypothesis for, um, kind of structure. So the alternative um, to this one right here is that either you believe that it's possibly less, you have some reason to believe that it's less, let's, let's put those two there. So this is the null. The alternative hypothesis may be that you believe that um, less than 50% of the population wants to allow bear on the beach or wants to allow um, a particular issue or wants to vote for a particular candidate. So you may believe that it's to the left of that, meaning it's less than. Um, and the typical kind of structure is that it looks like this. This would be a statement of a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. And then we move forward with getting a sample. And that sample may be something like this. And we want to know what's the probability of that occurring. Now, but the alternative could be um, we believe that we want to test this. Or maybe the alternative is that we wish to test. Um, we don't know if it's necessarily, we don't have a belief that it's necessarily less than, so that it's not equal. Or the alternative could be that we believe that it's greater than. So one of these will be stated as the alternative hypothesis. So um, this one is to the left, this one's just simply not equal to the null hypothesis, and this one is assumed to be greater. Now, once we get that, once we establish this test to look to see if it's less than, greater, or greater than, or simply not equal, we'll get a probability, and that probability is going to be compared against some level um, of confidence or some level at which we wish to reject. So in our test, um, we're going to decide to reject the, um, the, the null hypothesis. Like if we do our test and if our test statistic happens with a level less than, say, 5%, um, then we're going to um, make a decision as to either accept or reject the null hypothesis. So once we've completed our test, we've generated our test statistic, um, 
Associated with it is the probability of it occurring by chance, that test statistic. And so that probability, since we know the distribution, we can figure out what that probability is. Is it 7% that, that we generated? Is it a 7% um, likelihood that that could have been generated by chance? 8%, 5%, whatever it is, we need to compare it to some other value. And we're going to say, if that value that we've generated um, is less than, um, right, if it's less than alpha, then that's strong evidence against um, the null hypothesis. Strong evidence against the null hypothesis if the probability of an event occurring is less than um, the significance level. All right, so um, let's see how we are going to work these tests. Um, the typical setup for, for these tests will look something like this. And all right, um, depending on if it's a left-tailed, right-tailed, or a two-tailed test. It's going to be one of these three kind of frameworks. So I will use this as a rubric. So the first step is typically to kind of set it up in terms of null and alternative hypotheses. And also in parallel with that, you'd want to um, set it up as either a left-tailed or right-tailed or a two-tailed test. Um, and so for each one of these tests, um, although we could set this up so that alpha is something other than 5%, for all of these, we're going to assume that 5% is the level at which Anything less than that, we're going to say it's strong evidence against the null hypothesis, and we want to reject the null hypothesis. So alpha equals 5% corresponds to this area here. So what's in blue corresponds to alpha. Alpha equals 5% corresponds to that area, and alpha course, um, equaling 5% means that 2.5% and 2.5% um, is what we're looking at. Probability that, um, that alpha occurs, that this test statistic occurs either to the left or to the right. If that's less than 5%, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Um, now, there is a z-value um, at which we're going to um, compare everything against. So this isn't our test statistic, it's the z-value that corresponds to 5%. So that critical value that corresponds to 5% can be determined by inverse norm and then the area that we're looking at is 0 0.05. If that area is something other than 5%, then we would have to put that area inside of here. But to keep it um, simple or straightforward or consistent, we're going to use 5%. So the critical value at 5% um, is negative 1.645, and that's for a left tail test. The critical value um, for a right tail test at 5%, well, you would use inverse norm again area to the left of the point is 95. 
and if you plug in 0.95 you'd come up with positive 1.645 and the area um, to the left of this point is 0 0.025 and if you plug that into inverse norm on your calculator you'd get a critical value of negative 1.96 and over here positive um, this right here would be a 1.96 which makes sense plus or minus two standard deviations um, cover 95 and 100 percent is what we'd get by adding in the 2.5 and 2.5 so this is a fixed picture um, a fixed kind of rubric that we're going to use to guide us doesn't change much it's going to be one of these three what could change is the alpha level it could be one percent it could be ten percent and that changes the critical value but let's work with five percent as the um, as the significance level right that's the, the value at which we'll say that the results of our test are significant or not so let's do an example with this. So let's say we have two candidates, Mr. We'll call them Mr. A and Mr. B. They're running for city council. Um, Mr. A believes that 30% or fewer. Uh, of the population wish to allow oh, pot smoking, marijuana smoking in public areas. So I'll say that this is, um, they want to allow, let's abbreviate it, pot in the park. 30% or fewer. Um, and the other candidate, Mr. B, um, what he believes is that that's not true. Um, he's essentially saying that, yeah, Mr. A, you're, you're wrong. Um, so he believes that the opposite of that is true. So whereas Mr. A believes that 30% or fewer wish to allow pot in the park, um, Mr. B believes that it's actually greater than 30%. Um, that is just simply greater. As a convention, what your uh, textbook author suggests is that um, when looking at these two, the, the one with the equality is the one that we're going to set as the null hypothesis, and we're going to only take the equality. So when we set this up as a null hypothesis, the null hypothesis isn't going to be less than or equal, even though that was the statement. Um, we're going to just simply take the equality and then the alternative is this right here so I'll write that again in a second um, so Mr. B says you're wrong so he sponsors a survey to sample a number of people So he sponsors a survey to disprove Mr. A's claim. So here's here's our our setup. The initial idea, the null hypothesis, it's believed that the percentage of individuals um, is greater than or equal to, so we'll say 30%, 0.3. The alternative hypothesis 
um, did I say greater than? So it's actually not greater than, but less than or equal to. Um, the alternative hypothesis is that it's greater than. So we've set up our test. Um, and we want to make a decision at, um, at the alpha equals 5% um, level of significance. So alpha equals 0 0.05. And once we know that we're testing either left or right, we also, we also have the level of significance. I find it helpful to just simply draw it as the right tail to test um, at showing the 5% level of significance. And then also showing the value the critical value that corresponds with that 1.645 and so we're going to see from this curve what our test statistic is to see if it resides here then we say that's not improbable enough or if it resides here or if it goes into the mud if it goes into the blue then that value could uh, it actually occurs with less than 5% probability if it's that far away or greater, it means that it occurs with less than 5% and it's improbable and it's strong evidence against this being the truth. So that picture, before we do anything else, really kind of defines the test and you'll see that that's consistent. So de de uh, decide if it's going to be a left or right tail test, um, set up a picture established your critical value. Um, more often than not, that critical value is just going to be 1.645 or negative 1.645 if it's um, if it's a left-tailed and or if it's two-tailed it's going to be plus or minus 1.96. Alright, so now we go get a sample of some number of individuals figure out what percentage wish to um, vote, wish to actually allow pot in the park, marijuana smoking in the park, and then we're going to um, compare that to our assumed value. So this null hypothesis value is 0.3. And then we're going to do the bit of math to determine what that z value is. So, in a simple random sample of 400 voters. 160 favored pot in the park. That tells us that our sample proportion is 160 out of 400 or 0.4. So now we can use that to figure out what our z-value is. So our z-value then, based on this formula that we see here, is 0 0.4 minus the null hypothesis value of 0.3 since the null hypothesis value was 
q naught, which is always the complement, is going to be 1 minus p naught. Those two values must always add up to 1, not, positive, not negative 1, but 1. So this has to be 0 0.7. p naught and q naught are 0.3 and 0.7. So this is 0 0.3, 0 0.7. And the total number of individuals question is 400. and we take the square root of that value. If you enter those numbers into your calculator, you should get 4.364. Um, so intuitively, we know that most things happen um, within three standard deviations. This is outside of that three standard deviation window. So if it were really true um, that 30% um, are inter only merely 30% are interested in, in pot in a park. This is so far above that 30%, it seems improbable. And how do we know it's quote unquote far above? The z value tells us the number of standard deviations. Um, so it seems improbable. Um, not only that, we have our 4.364, and our 4.364 that we just determined goes beyond the 1.645 and it's somewhere to the right of it. So 4.364. So we've gone into um, this area here where it's improbable um, that this could happen merely by chance. Um, so this is strong evidence against the null hypothesis strong evidence against Mr. A's belief, which was the null hypothesis. So just comparing our z value to the critical value. So since our test statistic that, since it's greater than our critical value, meaning we're kind of in the blue, in the mud, um, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and then the other thing is, is that's that's either one of these is going to be sufficient. Either we do this one, or we can make that same conclusion by looking at the probability of that value occurring. So that alone is enough for us to stop, reject the null hypothesis. That's just based on determining the test statistic and seeing if it's greater than a critical value. The test statistic and seeing if it's greater than a critical value. Now, the p-value, what's the probability of that occurring? Um, we can determine that as well. That 4.364 that's here, if we want to know the area, right, that corresponds to the probability, that gives you the probability of a value that large or greater occurring, right, if we want to know the probability of a value z greater than 4.364 occurring, um, then um, then we can use normal CDF. The left bound is the 4.364. The right bound goes all the way out to 99999, what I'll typically call positive infinity in this case. If you plug that in, you'll get a 6.4 times 10 to the negative 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, um, so 0.6, that's um, 6.38, or I'll round off and I'll just call it 6.4. So 6.4 times 10 to the negative 6, that's almost 0% chance of this occurring. So this is the p-value, the probability that this test statistic could occur
is our p-value. And that's improbable. So we have we can use either one of these methods to make a decision. Comparing to a critical value, that's our kind of our critical value test. Take our test statistic and see how it compares to the critical value. And then the other test is our p-value test. And so since if the p-value that we get is less than alpha, then right, if our p-value is less than alpha, our significance level. Um, then once again, both of these will always lead to the same conclusion. Reject the null hypothesis. Um, so your only choice is to either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject. So it doesn't mean that you've proven that this is true from your sample. It means that you have strong evidence against this. So either you get evidence against it or you don't. But that's not the same as saying you have evidence um, that says to, uh, to indicate that you're value your test statistic your test statistic is true so um, your answer is either to reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis those are your choices once you've completed um, your critical value test or your p-value, um, your p-value, your p-value test. So what we've just done, um, we could also use our calculator to help us. If you go to stats, test, and it's a single proportion. Um, don't forget at the very beginning I talked about at some point we may look at two proportion we should get a chance to look at double proportions but we're just looking at one single proportion um, and then comparing it to one other proportion not the difference compared to another difference um, so our null hypothesis was this value here of 0.3 And our proportion that we're looking at um, was 160 out of 400. So the 160 voted um, this way, 160 voted um, to approve pot in the park. Out of the total of 400, notice that this looks like numerator over denominator, it's helpful to remember. And then here we get to choose which test we're looking at. Is it a two-tailed, a left-tailed, or a right-tailed? And it was a right-tailed test that we just did. And let's do the calculations. And um, looking at what we see here. we should have the same values. That one was lost. Let me go back, make sure we didn't lose the information that was put in there. One prop Z test. Keep the values. Drop to the bottom. Let's do the calculation. And we have that right there. So using our TI-84 calculator doing a right tail test as indicated generating we'll see that it, it does the work for us generates is equals 4.365 and a probability of 6.4 times 10 to the negative 6 and those numbers that we're looking at the 6.4 times 10 to the negative 6 we know where they're coming from um, and the 4.364 we know where that's coming from it's just automating some of that work for us
And since we initially drew this as our rubric here, we know that our rejection level, our critical value of 1.645, if we had just simply punched these numbers into the calculator, we would have looked at our test statistic and we would have been able to compare this to 1.645 to see that um, 4.6 exceeds the 1.645 and it gets us into this um, this level of re at which we are going to reject the no hypothesis. So it gives us both informa pieces of information. It gives us the test statistic here and it also gives us the p-value, the probability at which that test statistic occurs. Um, it tells us what our sample um, proportion was, the 0.4, and we determined that previously ourselves. So it just automates that process for us. So that's how you do a, um, a hypothesis test a right-tailed hypothesis test for proportions. Um, now the next thing that we're going to look at is how you would do a hypothesis test um, dealing with means. And let's make this one a left-tailed test. Um, and also before we do that, let's summarize this. So um, what I will look for is more than just simply you coming up with the test statistic and then you, you're you telling me reject the null hypothesis. Um, so what I'll look for is a statement like this. So here's the conclusion and it's a justified conclusion. Since the test statistic Z equals 4.364 is greater than our critical value um, 1.645. We have strong evidence against the null hypothesis. Um, uh, we have strong evidence against null hypothesis, against H0, the null hypothesis. Um, so we reject H0. And what this says is that the data that we've gathered provides sufficient evidence and now here is where you make a statement about rejecting the null hypothesis and so we want to say the opposite of what it was um, provide sufficient evidence um, that the actual proportion of voters um, is not um, greater than or not less than so um, so he believed that it was fewer 30 percent or fewer that it's not um, 30 percent or fewer in support of pot in the park <clears throat> 